Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. I want to encourage you with the scripture this morning. Psalm 104 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God. Thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. We serve a great God. And it says he's clothed with honor and majesty. He's so worthy of our worship, worthy of our praise this morning. And we just came to give him glory and honor to bless his name. And we also know there are some that can't be with us this morning that want to be there. We want to remember them in prayer as we go to the Lord, asking him to have his way this morning. We want to believe that God's going to reach down and touch them right where they are. So if you would just go with me to to the Lord in prayer and ask him to just have his way this morning. God, we just bless your name, Jesus. We come to do exactly what this scripture says, to bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh Lord, my God, we want to bless your name this morning. Jesus, we love you, we worship you, we praise you, God. And Lord, we just ask that you would minister to those who can't be here this morning. Lord, there's so many that are sick or going through difficult things. Lord, you know right where they are. We ask you, Lord, that you meet them at their point of need. God, just do only what you can do. And Lord, we will give you glory. We will give you honor. Lord, you're so worthy. You're so good. You've been so faithful. You're such an amazing and awesome and mighty God. And, Lord, we lift up your name, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. We give you glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, can we just give him some glory this morning? Rest. 
Can you tell him how good he, he is? Father, we love you, Jesus. We bless your name, God. We praise you, O oh Lord. You're so worthy, O oh God. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, the walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out. I'll when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name. Come on, can we bless the name? Blessed be your name. We bless your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious you name. You give. You give and take away. Oh Lord, you give. You give and take away. My heart will choose. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. Lord, you give. You give and take away. My heart will choose. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious oh, you give. name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be. Your name. You give and take away, Lord, you give. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on, sing that chorus again. Glorious name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Lord, we bless your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Lord, we bless you, Jesus. We bless you, oh God. Come on, church. He's worthy. He's worthy. God, we bless you, Lord. You're so worthy. You've been so faithful. You're so good. Because 
today, you will feel by you and you're going to do mighty things in the lives of those that obey you we give you praise and glory in the name of jesus amen there's nothing worth more that could ever come You're our living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love, when my heart becomes my shame is
Question is not is God dead? The question is, are we? That's right. Not, the question is not if God's alive or not. The question is, are we alive in His spirit or not? That's right. But it only takes some simple obedience to come alive in His spirit. In, in His spirit, just to simply say, God, I believe in you. I trust in you. I seek your face today. You will experience the presence of God. We may be physically alive, but that don't mean we're spiritually alive. Your spirit has to be quickened and awakened by God. But today, if you want your spirit to come alive, I think every one of us, from the pulpit to the back row, we need the Lord today. I know I need Him. I need Him to quicken my spirit today. We need Him to quicken our spirit to bring us fully back to life. If you need the breath of God in your spiritual lungs today, lift your hands right now with me. And let's say, Holy Spirit, come. Oh, God, put your fire back in my heart. Come on, pray that prayer with me. Put your fire, Lord, back in my heart. Lord, breathe fresh air in my lungs. Bring life in this place, Lord. Bring life into me, oh, God. Quicken my spirit, oh, God. I thank you, God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to remain standing just for a moment. I'm going to read God's Word pretty quickly here. Let me mention that this Wednesday is our Valentine's banquet. We're not having a normal service, but we're going to meet at 6.30. Not 7, but 6.30 this Wednesday for our Valentine's banquet. And this is something open to everybody. It's, It's, you know... It's, it's a family thing. I know the theme of, you know, couples and lovebirds and husbands and wives and all that, that's, that's part of Valentine's Day. But, but the theme of love is for everybody, whoever you are, young or old, married or single, whatever the case may be. We want you to be here this Wednesday night 
and we're going to be serving a very nice meal free of charge. Any donations that you wish to give will be going to help our young people go to youth camp this year, and they'll be serving us. The youth, the, the youth are going to be helping us serve tables, and it's going to be a great time. There'll be some entertainment. We're going to have a great time of fellowship. Just by a show of hands, how many are you going to do your best to try to be here this Wednesday night? 6.30? Because I'd just like to get a generalized count until we got get food ready. So I want you to, even if you didn't raise your hand, we want you to come. We want you to come. If you're not sure yet, see if you can arrange your schedule. But it's going to be a great time this Wednesday night. Amen. Turn with me to... 2 Samuel chapter 9, I'm going to read verses 3 through 11. While you're turning there, I'm going to say that over the next few weeks, I'm going to speak on the power of kindness. And each week, I want to take a different emphasis. This week is going to be showing kindness towards our family. We celebrate, of course, Valentine's Day and Again, the theme of love is there. And I want you to think about showing love and kindness to your family this week. Be looking on uh, social media if you're connected to Life Church on Facebook. If you're not, click like. Just say, I like that page. Click on it. And you can keep up with all the updates. And I'm going to be asking uh, the pastoral team to share posts this week. We're going to be asking each one of you to share post this week. If you're on Facebook, I want you to see some practical ways to express kindness. I'm going to be putting some out there. But today, I want us to concentrate on what the Word of God says about showing kindness. And we're reading here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, the king said, this is David, is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel. And lo, the king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when the was coming to David. He fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon him such a dead dog? As I am. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servants, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. We're going to unpack the scripture in a minute, but I want you to pray with me one more time. Let's put our hearts together as one. Let's fervently pray and let's ask God to reveal his word to us as only his Holy Spirit can. Father, I yield myself to you today as we pray together as a congregation. Lord, let your word come open to us. Lord, use me, God, how you desire to use me. Lord, I must have your spirit to impart this word. Unfold it into our hearts and let every person in this place, Lord, find your will, find your transforming power for their lives, for their families. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can you give God praise one more time before you're seated? Let him know you love him. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen.
Kindness is a virtue that is marked by action. Even though many cultures and religions recognize the power of kindness, and even non-religious people are capable of good deeds, there's really only one original source of ir, uh, of incorruptible kindness. There's re really only one source where true kindness emanates from, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. No one would understand love or kindness or mercy or any of these qualities if it did not, did not originate from God first. We read in our text today that David asked this question, Is there anyone left in Saul's family that I can show kindness to? Is there anybody in the family left that I can do something for to show them, you know, forgiveness, healing, reconciliation? So showing kindness to Saul's family was David's way of pretty much of putting, putting some things that were painful in his past behind him. Did you know that kindness can help you put some painful things in your past? You see, David would be investing kindness into family even when, for the most part, family hadn't invested kindness unto him. I'll explain. He said, is there anyone left in Saul's family that I can show kindness to? When you really consider uh, David's relationship with Saul and how badly Saul treated David, you can start to you can start to wrap your mind around what a huge move of faith and reconciliation this was for David to make. The reason I tie the the symbolism of family showing kindness into your family into this story is because this story to me is kind of a mirror of a modern day family. It's a broken family. Because even though Saul was not David's biological father, in many ways he was a second father to him. He would really become David's father in law. As a matter of fact, he would marry Saul's daughter, Michael. And so he would be his father in law, but even before that happened, Saul kind of stood in place as David's father. Kind of like the modern concept. Many families today are broken, and many lives have to start over again. You know, there are marriages, multiple marriages in many people's lives. It's just a reality of what's happening today. And many, many young people today have no relationship with their, with their biological fathers. Sometimes uh, their biological parents in general, they're out of touch with them. But there are opportunities, of course, even in the brokenness of modern, the modern life we're living in to find reconciliation and to find healing. And in David's case, he had Saul standing in place of his own father, Jesse. Jesse was still alive, but Jesse did not really believe in David. He, he did not even see the potential in David. And so God plucked David up and said, I'm going to do something great with your life, and I'm going to choose to anoint you, and I'm going to elevate you to be king. But his father couldn't see it. And Saul had an opportunity as the current king to mentor David and to prepare him for the throne. But he did not do that. He did not really show him love. He did not really show him respect. He didn't try to pull the gifts out of David. He tried to keep him down because he felt his post as king was threatened by David's presence. It was a relationship plagued with jealousy and rage on Saul's part. Can you just imagine with me for a minute? Put yourself in David's shoes. He was from a dysfunctional family. He had a dysfunctional childhood. His brothers criticized him. His father took no interest in him. And like a modern kid with no supervision, he learns to survive on the streets. He learned to survive alone by himself himself. 
on the hills of a Judean wilderness tending ship sheep. David basically raised himself because nobody was there to pour into him. If it wasn't for the prophet Samuel, David would have had nobody. But God still had his hand on his life. Let me just veer a little bit from the theme of kindness and just tell somebody, tell somebody here today that God is ultimately the one that will be with you in daytime and nighttime, in the wilderness, in the good times and the bad times. And because God had his hand on David's life, he would become something great. And I want to tell you, it doesn't matter what the devil's cursed, God still can bless what the devil's cursed and God's blessings will break the curses of Satan. If you believe that, give God praise. Amen. So David really didn't have anybody. He was handed over to Saul. And Saul couldn't handle the anointing on his life. So in fear of losing his own position to the young upstart, it got so bad that one day Saul thrust a javelin at David but failed to kill him. That's how bad his rage had gotten. And that moment would begin eight years of David being on the run from Saul and trying to survive his jealous wrath. Kind of like a young person and their teens seeking and searching, trying to find their identity. David would go on the run for eight years, really not knowing what was going to become of him. He still believed God. He wrote some of the greatest psalms during this time. But still, not knowing day to day what's going to happen next in survival mode constantly not really knowing how this was going to form his life and if all the promises that God had said were actually going to come true. He was, uh, he was in a quagmire of emotions uh, and he was trying to sort all through this just a young man alone on the run. And as with many dysfunctional relationships uh, at this time of his life, uh, and I may be speaking to some teenagers here today, I've come on assignment for whosoever will. Whoever this hits today, hear what I'm saying. But David, in his young days, in this time, in these eight years of being on the run, he could have developed a deep-seated hate for his father-in-law, Saul. He could have, he could have developed a deep-seated hate for his biological father, Jesse. But never once do you hear of David turning bitter towards his family. Even when he had the chance to kill Saul, he left vengeance in the hands of God. Hear what I'm saying today. You don't have to go out and try to get even even with those that's hurt you. You don't, try to, you don't have to try to go out and ask God to hurt those that hurt you. Just let God have His way and you stay close to the heart of God. That's really the salvation of David's life is because he was a man after God's own heart before he became a full-grown man after God's own heart. He was a teenager after God's own heart. Before that, he was an adolescent boy after God's own heart. I'm I'm telling you today, you draw close to God and God will draw close to you. You forgive others as Paul said in Ephesians and God will forgive you. God will do only what God can do. You've got to trust Him. There's power in kindness. There's no power in vengeance. The only kind of power vengeance can have is the power to destroy. But the power of kindness has the power to restore. What kind of power do you want working through your life? Do you want to just have the power to destroy or you want to have the power to restore. I'd rather see the power to restore because that means the next generation still has a chance because I haven't done the same things to them that were done to me. Come on somebody. If you don't want the same problems to arise in the next generation, start dealing with them now, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you. Remember, an ongoing conflict will just continue to cost future generations. A bumper sticker said, you are to teach your kids. Let me rephrase this. You, you teach your kids how to treat you by the way you treat your parents. You teach your kids how to treat you by the way you treat your parents. 
The same could be said about the way you treat your spouse. You teach your child how to treat their future spouse by the way you treat their mother or their father. So the question we have to ask ourselves as adults in this place, what kind of example are we setting for the next generation? Let me just give a little instruction today. A little salt will help heal the wound, okay? It'll help repair what the surgery did, what the surgery did to remove. So I'm telling you today, first of all, dads, you may sing a little bit, but you need to hear your son will never know how to reconcile with you unless you reconcile with your dad. Your son will never learn how to treat his future wife with respect and dignity if you've never modeled it in your home and treated your wife with respect and dignity. Dads, it also goes for your, your daughters, especially when they become teenage daughters. Your teenage daughter will be inclined to turn towards some other male figure for love and acceptance if she doesn't find that love and acceptance from you, Dad especially while she's a little child, show her the love and acceptance that only a father can give. Likewise, mothers, mom, your son will never learn to trust a woman if he doesn't see respectability and honor in your lifestyle and faithfulness to God and your husband. Your daughter will repeat the same mistakes, mom. The same mistakes that you now regret if you don't make some radical changes that will bring virtuosity in your home. Because you're setting a standard, moms and dads, for future generations. James 4 and 1 tells us, in essence, that conflict arises from the prideful and selfish motives of the flesh. So if conflict arises from pride and selfish motives, therefore kindness on the other hand, must spring forth from humility because it's the opposite of pride. Kindness is when you prioritize relationship over the issues. Sure, we all have a list of things that we wish other people would fix in their lives. Sure, we do. People we love. People that we have, you know, a bloodline collect, uh, connection with. Some we've been grafted in with family-wise. And we, we always see what somebody else needs to change. But, but kindness is when you prioritize your relationship with a person over the issues. Because ultimately, your relationship with them is greater. It's more important than the conflict that you might have with them. Ultimately, the love you have for them, the healing that God can do in that relationship is greater than the grudge that you feel or that you're pressed by the devil to have against that person. You know, what's the point of bracing and holding to a position and holding out to, uh, on, on the way you feel about something if it only furthers pain in your family, if it's only going to drag you back towards pain and misery and cause further division? What good is it just to hold on to that position? It ain't helping nobody. It ain't helping nothing. you got to start forgiving. Come on, somebody. Listen, I wanted to pull an evangelistic message out of the, out of the briefcase today and preach to scream about revival, but God wouldn't let me go, and he told me to tell you some practical stuff about living. I'm trying to tell you today, God wants to heal some wounds, but you can't afford to hold a grudge. you got to let go. Leviticus 19 and 18 said, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, what I'm saying today is that kindness has a, a, a power to reconcile. It reconciles from where you are now. Kindness is not a time machine. It will not go back in time and fix what went wrong, what happened years ago. You can't erase that. You can't fix that. you, you got to put it under the blood. But you, you don't have the power to go back and say that never existed. Only God can, can set the person free. Maybe if it's something, a grievous sin or a terrible error in somebody's life. Only God can, can administer the healing to that. But 
Listen, kindness today can start to give you a new start from where you are. Kindness starts with what's right about your relationship, not what's wrong with it. There's still some things left that are worth cultivating. There's still some things left in the relationship, in our families, to help us start from where we are. You know, I'm talking about something that is active and and a present day experience. Oh, my Lord, help me today. I got to tell you today, there are a lot of things that happened yesterday. And some of us want to sing that Beatles song yesterday all the time. We want to hang out in yesterday. But God says today is the day of salvation. Today's the day to turn it around. You're only going to live in the pain of what happened yesterday if you don't start living in the present of what God can do today. Today, God says to you, why don't you reach out? Why don't you start trying a different angle? You see, kindness says, I miss you today. Oh, I'm not calling you to tell you what you did wrong to me yesterday, but I'm trying to tell you I miss you. It says, how are you doing? Kindness is also the moment you call and say, I know it's been a while, but I've had you on my mind. You know, some folks uh, that you don't call enough uh, or that don't ever call you. You get a little awkward when you reach out to them. But you'll get over that awkwardness. Give it about five minutes. Just start pouring in the kindness. It may be like burning hot coals on their head. They may not know what to do with it. But you just keep pouring it in. You say, you know, brother, I miss you. You know, dad, I hadn't heard from you a while. You know, son or daughter, you hadn't called me in a while. But you know what? I've been thinking about you and I love you. You don't have to start off saying you hadn't called me. But just tell them, hey, I miss you. I miss you and I want to talk with you today. Do you have a minute? I'm telling you something dynamic can start to happen. It may be painful in your spirit because you have to give to show kindness. You have to dig deeply in a place that's uncomfortable in your spirit. But when you do, power can be unleashed. Why don't you just start praying ahead of time? Father God, would you get in the middle of this? Help me and anoint me to make the steps toward reconciliation in my family and God will help you do it. I don't know if this is about for about three or four people in here or if it's for most of the congregation, but I'm preaching to somebody today. Because God's calling us. Calling us to mend calling us to step over that great divide. Sending an unexpected card or a gift that says happy birthday or thinking of you. Anything, any step towards the right direction with the right attitude is going to be helpful. Don't always expect to be treated fairly on the other end of things. When you try to do this. Because if you expect that, then you've already walked into it with the wrong motives. You're ready to be disappointed. You'll have to you'll have to have you have to pray for some Teflon emotional skin. And you have to say, God, I know I'm gonna have to endure. I probably have to endure some more pain to bring this together, but I'm gonna walk into it and trust you. Because it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Colossians chapter 3. God said, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And over all these things, over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Clothe yourself. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And love binds it all together in perfect unity. David said, is there anyone that I can still show kindness to? I'm looking for an opportunity to reconcile. I need, I need an opportunity. The past was painful to me, but I'm ready to do something new. I'm ready to show some kindness and bring some things back together. You know when you ask God for an opportunity, He'll grant it to you. He'll grant it to you. When you ask God for an opportunity to start reconciling the pain of a broken past, 
he'll start helping you find ways. So the word came back to David. There is still a son of Jonathan. This is significant. It was significant that it was Jonathan's son who needed kindness because it was Jonathan who made a covenant with the house of David in 1 Samuel 18 and 3. This was one of the most unique friendships in the word of God because Jonathan was Saul's biological son. And Jonathan was in line for the throne. But Jonathan preferred David over himself. He loved David. He developed a friendship with him. This was a lifeline for David. Where he had no love or no acceptance with the king, he found acceptance and love from his best friend, the king's son, Jonathan. Jonathan gave up his own position in order to help his brother-in-law, Remember, he was married to Jonathan's sister. And she wasn't, she wasn't very kind to David. She got on to David for praising God, if you'll remember. Nobody was showing kindness to David except for Jonathan. And Jonathan gave up his own position in order to become a person who would help David succeed his father and become Israel's next king. So that was the covenant connection. So while Saul was trying to kill David, Jonathan was helping him escape. Covenant is important. I want you to understand, the reason I'm telling you this is to is explain to you that covenant is an important thing. It's a powerful thing. What is covenant? It's a life or death agreement you make with someone else. And as a person that is related to another person, there's an automatic covenant that must be honored you have a commitment to feel a life or death agreement to fulfill as a father mother son daughter brother sister aunt uncle cousins or grandparents and whether you like it or not you even have a covenant commitment to the in-laws brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws the covenant of family is so powerful then when that when when it was violated by the first murder in recorded history the voice of injustice was defined by the blood of the slain brother of Cain. You remember Cain slew his brother Abel, and God said Abel's blood cries out to me from the ground. The covenant between brother and brother was so powerful that when it was violated, even after Abel's death, his blood retained a voice that cried out for justice you see this violation of God's purpose and order for family doesn't mean he's changed his mind about the whole thing no no matter what's happened no matter what kind of relatives you belong to God's got a purpose he wants to bring out of your family whether you have a traditional family a blended family a hybrid family like David did whether it is an adopted family a foster home family whatever the case may be God's got a purpose for the family even if it's a broken family it's not beyond repair there's still something start where you are and go from there there's still something God can do you may be like David alienated from everybody else maybe you've only got one real friend that you feel that you can trust maybe you feel like nobody is there for you maybe you have disconnected so far from others in your family that you don't feel like you can go back to where you were. But I want to tell you, God said in the middle of this chaos and this confusion, the blueprints for covenant still exist and God will still help you find a channel to reconnect. Oh my God. God Almighty, I wish I could tell somebody that God's going to bring healing. I don't think there's enough faith to receive it this morning. Who am I preaching to? Do you have the faith to receive it? Uh, let the old cloud get off your head today. Wake up. Smell the spiritual coffee. I'm trying to tell you God's going to shake this thing and awake you and help you in this thing. God's going to bring some connections back. There's been some deep wounds. Uh, you can't go back and get remarried unless God said get remarried. But listen, there's such a rift between 
husband and wives uh, that you can't even can't even figure out how to raise your child. Listen, if they're in your arms or they're in their arms, uh, God's still got a plan for that baby. God's going to help you in the middle of that. Uh, after the crumbling divorce, uh, after the brokenness uh, that you've been through, uh, after daddy left home and left you holding the bag and left you to raise the kids. Come on, somebody. God's still going to get in the middle of the mess uh, and bring something good out of it just trust him and don't live with a vengeful spirit but trust God for the healing trust him for the healing hey I feel the power of faith now the power of faith is going to help you walk in the power of kindness you got to believe you got to believe you got to trust God hey you see these covenants are not easily broken Jeremiah said if you can figure out a way to break the covenant of God, you can figure out how to, you know, break the cycle of day and night so that they don't always arrive on schedule. If you can change when the moon shows up in the sky and when the sun arises out of the east, then you can, you can break this covenant that God has made. None of us can actually do that. It cannot be broken that easily. I'm on my last point today. We're going to talk about Mephibosheth. The only one left to show kindness to. Mephibosheth from Lodabar. It's because of this covenant that the character of Mephibosheth shows up in the storyline Someone whom David could bless and reconcile the strife between him and Saul. Despite David's struggles, he was now king and in a position to do something nice to someone from Saul's house. Everything David had working against him in his past, God had made up for in divine favor. David had the divine favor of God on him, but he had a need to reach out and do something good for a member of Saul's family. Mephibosheth, on the other hand, had suffered grievously because of the sins of his father. Because of the sins of Saul's house. He was five years old. Saul with his grandfather, I should explain. But he was five years old when Jonathan was killed in battle, when his father was killed in battle, fearing that the Philistines would seek to take the life of the young boy, a nurse fled with Mephibosheth in her arms, and she dropped him when she was running, and both of his feet were crippled. He was carried off to the land of Gilead, where he found refuge at a town called Lodabar. A lot of good preaching in this. Maybe I'll revisit it a little bit later. But Lodabar was a word that denotes denial. Most scholars believe it can be translated as no pasture. In other words, it wasn't a spacious place like David talked about in Psalms 18 and 19. It was a place of no pasture, no rest, a place of denial where you live if you've been denied everything. He'd been denied the ability to walk. He'd been denied his father. He'd been denied safety and security. It wasn't a place of rest or, provi or provision. It, it, it was a place without hope. This is where Mephibosheth lived. But this is the exact scenario that so many people find themselves in today. When I talk about this is a, a picture of a modern family, it is in more ways than one. Think about Mephibosheth. Families misplaced, marriages in exile, children alienated from the love and attention they need. And this represents, too, the inner conflict that so many families have. Why 
do we have so much conflict? Why is there so much conflict within families? The probable answer is this. It's because the devil is fighting families. He hates the institution of marriage. He hates family order and the things that comes from it. He hates when everything's working according to God's divine plan. When there is an act of father and a mother in the home and they're raising their child according to the word of God. You see, if the devil can destroy the family unit, he knows he can destroy society because family is the foundation of all human society and the means through which God has chosen to model his covenant with us. If he can get us to to have a broken view, a misunderstanding of family, then he can keep people blinded to the reality that Jesus came to love us, to die for our sins, to win us as his bride because that's the model. Our relationship with God is a relationship of family. He said in Ephesians chapter 5, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so you see this relationship between us and God is like the husband and the bride. And Paul also said in Ephesians that every family in heaven and on earth derives its name from our Father in heaven. And so the devil seeking to keep our society in darkness by trying to destroy families. If he can get people to have a fragmented view and a messed up view of family, then he can even use that to keep them blinded to the healing grace that he wants to give us. But no matter how you feel about your family, anything that God has said is worth dying for and anything he personally puts his name on must be worth investing in. He said, husbands, love your wives. There's instruction to the wives too, but I'm just, man, I'm just using this to let you know that he said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her. He said, your wife is worth dying for. Your family is worth investing your whole life for. And if it's that important, if it's that important, then it's worth us taking another look at and investing in or reinvesting in. If you want to look at what happens to families, what happens to individuals, when sin and selfish behavior reign, look no further than Mephibosheth. You see, he's somebody who got left behind. Don't use your child as a pawn to hurt the one that hurt you. Mephibosheth was thrown to the side. Somebody gets left behind when selfish behavior reigns. Somebody we are supposed to be truly responsible for. David may have never had this cross his mind to this moment, but David, in a sense, although he seemed to be far removed from this, and he could have said, they've done a lot to hurt me, and I'm not going to even do anything to reach out to them. Yet it did not take the responsibility away from David to reach out and try to help Mephibosheth. He was responsible by way of relationship, although he had been hurt also. By Saul. Nevertheless, God had blessed him anyway. Mephibosheth had not yet been blessed. And David saw an opportunity. He's like, God's blessed me. God's helped me. God's preserved me. Now I'm going to help somebody else. You see, God raises a lot of people out of the dustbin. He pulls a lot of people out of the ghetto. He pulls a lot of people out of darkness. He brings a lot of people out of broken homes and lifts them up and establishes them so that they can reach out and help somebody else that is in the same junk they were in that has not yet received the help that they received from the hand of the Lord. I want to tell you today that God had a plan for David. And I'm telling somebody today that God helped you a long time ago and you thought life was about to overcome you and you were going to be broken forever and you are going to be lost to 
and everything, but God somehow saved you and lifted you up. Listen, He didn't give you that good job. He didn't help you. He didn't help you pass that uh, depression uh, and, and all that stuff you were going through in order that you could just live from now on and, and, and selfishness and a lavish lifestyle. No, God has called you and established you to reach back and find somebody else that's hurting, that's come from where you came from and to reach and help them. It's that covenant with the house of Saul that, that David had. He could never go back to not caring anymore. God's put a covenant with you. It could be somebody. It could be a distant cousin, but I don't know who it is, but it could be somebody that you've got a distant covenant with. It could be it some could somebody be somebody that you were related to through marriage. But whatever the case may be, God may bring somebody back to your mind that needs you to reach out to them and bring reconciliation. It was this covenant. It was this covenant family connection. You see, he could have just killed the lion and the bear and killed Goliath and went on to greatness without looking out for anybody else, only looking out for number one. But there's some paths in life that you can't turn your back on, some doors that have no exit signs. And I'm telling you, family connections is one of those things you can't turn your back on. There's no exit signs in the hall of family. You can't just have God take your kids back once they're born. You can't just have God take your marriage back. You can't just say, you know, you may say, well, you know, you, some of you just couldn't help it. I understand divorce happens. I'm not throwing stones. But today, if you're in a situation today, you can't just say, I don't uh, want to be in this marriage anymore. There's going to be repercussions to what you're doing and what you're deciding to do with your future. You cannot just say, I'm not in love with this person anymore. What if God just woke up one day and said, you know what? I'm not in love with you anymore. Uh, you might as well just go ahead and take the first exit to hell because uh, I'm not in love with you anymore. No, God called me to love my wife and cover her for the rest of my days as long as there's breath in my body. Men, God's called you. I don't care if you got an eye on somebody else. Uh, get your eye back on your wife. Come on, somebody. Get your mind out of the gutter. Come on, somebody. Women, you can't just run around with any old man. Uh, I'm just preaching plain today. You got to keep your love at home and on your husband. He needs you. You can't just say, I'm through with this. Uh, there's going to be a fallout if you do. Uh, but God can still help those that fell out with divorce. If you've been through a divorce today, God's still going to help you with where you are. Remember, kindness starts with where you are. It's not a time machine to go back to yesterday. But I'm telling you, God can help you right now. God can change your heart. You can't change a lot of things. You can't force change. I can't force change on the church. You can't force change on family members. We have to trust God, but we can't change the fact of what happened, who our parents were, who our uncle or aunt was, who our brother or sister is. But the truth is we're responsible for each other. This is family. This is covenant. And God wants to help us find ways to bring healing into our lives, into our families, and bring the broken things back to life again. God can do it. And I'm going to tell you here at the end of this sermon as I'm coming to a close how we can take steps toward reconciliation. The power of kindness. How do you change things? As simple as it sounds, change comes through an act of kindness. When David's servant returned to his palace from Lodabar with Mephibosheth, the crippled son of Jonathan, David rolled out the red carpet and invited him to join him for dinner at his royal banquet table. The problem was that because of Mephibosheth's crippled condition, he struggled with his position. He was so oppressed in his mind that he described himself as a dead dog. We read that in our text. He said, what is your servant? Who am I, King David, that you should notice a dead dog like me? See, some folks are so burdened with guilt and shame, they can't even look at you square in the eye. And we get mad about that. Why won't they talk to me? I'm trying to be nice to them. 
they won't call, they won't say anything, they don't, they're not thoughtful. Well, maybe they just feel like a dead dog. Maybe they feel lower than a bullfrog's belly. Maybe they're so shameful. Maybe they don't even want to admit they've done anything wrong because they're afraid the guilt's going to crush them to death. David didn't let any of that bother him. He didn't let any of that dead dog talk bother him. He just rolled out the red carpet. I love you, Mephibosheth. I love you. Come on in. Can you imagine old Mephibosheth getting wheeled in there or carried in there? And his eyes are shifting around. He's thinking, they're fixed to kill me. They don't love me. This is a trick. You know, people have been living under that oppression for a long time. They, they think you're pulling a trick on them. They think you're playing a trick on them. They have to be convinced that love really exists. David saw him as a king's kid, even though he saw himself as a dead dog. <laughs> you didn't. You can get before God and say, my son disappointed me. My daughter hurt me. But I still see him as my child. My dad walked out on me. My mom didn't care for me, but I still see him as my dad and mom. Whether they are in the part, whether they're in the character or not, the role still exists, whether they're going to assume that role or not. So David said, you know what? I'm going to treat you like royalty because that's really what you are. You don't know it. You're in a dead dog state of mind, but I'm going to treat you with respect. You see, it takes a lot of personal stability and confidence to treat somebody else with respect. You don't respect themselves or respect anybody else. It takes, it takes a stable life. David had thought about this long and hard, and God had blessed him. He stood up on his own two feet and said, okay. I'm going to bless Mephibosheth, and I'm going to treat him right. He said, don't be afraid, for I'll surely show kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. Guess what, Mephibosheth? You see this empty chair right here? I've been saving it for you. You're going to eat at my table tonight. Every night thereafter, every day thereafter, Mephibosheth was put in that chair, and he ate from the king's table. Eventually, you have to imagine with me that eventually it started sinking in. You know what? Nobody walked up behind me when I'm sitting at this table and stabbed, stabbed me in the back yet. N nobody, nobody's, nobody's done anything. It, it took him a while, but the continual kindness had to sink in. And no doubt, Mephibosheth finally said to himself, it's okay that I'm here. It's okay that I'm loved. It's okay that this has been reconciled. I'm thankful that I can't change the past. My legs are still broken. I can't change the brokenness of the past. But I got something today that's made me very glad. Don't let the moment, don't let the opportunity of today Pass you by. Stand to your feet. I've spoken to you very clearly today. You know I have talked to you personally, the Lord says. For there has been much pain from your past. But I'm about to open the door, the Lord says, of healing and restoration. restoration. You must be willing to roll out the red carpet and show kindness. And I will bring the healing and the restoration. Just trust me. Trust me and be confident in, in this. For I'm your Lord, and I am in the God. I am the God of restoration. I am in the business of restoring lives. 
healing families. Yes, God. Yes, God. Today, I really believe the Lord has spoken. I know he has. He's spoken directly to someone today. It's true that I don't know where you are right now. I don't know how it feels necessarily to be in your shoes. Word of God doesn't lie. The Word of God doesn't change. If there is a hurt going on in your life due to brokenness from the past, especially if it involves family. And you're looking for God to open up a door that you may show kindness and bring a new start to an old issue to bring healing for today. Not that you can go back and fix what went wrong yesterday, but that you can start today on a new journey of healing. forgiveness if you're here today and this is you I'm going to invite you to be brave and honest and bold enough just to come up here and say God I need you I'm ready I'm ready for healing in my life I'm ready for healing in my family Listen, God's heard your cry. I hear the voice of the Lord in my ear saying, I've heard your cry. I have heard your heart's cry. And I know what you desire. You desire healing and reconciliation. And I will help you. I will help you. I will help you. It's been a hindrance way too long. It's been a hindrance way too long. It's been a hurt way too long. Today starts a journey of healing. Come on, it, today's a new day. Listen, it could have been it could have been 50 years ago for some or more. But the pain remains. Are you ready? Are you ready for some healing today? <laughs> 